welcome to Becoming Parents Podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Campbell. I'm a doula in Washoe County, Nevada, a Medicaid provider, a lactation educator, childbirth educator, and mom of 18. You can find me and connect on doulainreno.com. Remember, give a shout out to those who are brave enough to share their stories with us on how they have become parents. Let's dive in. Welcome to Becoming Parents. I'm the host, Jennifer Campbell. I'm really excited today. I have Courtney Boyer on. Courtney, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. And I know I said it would come up organically, but your book is right behind (laughs) your left shoulder. And I just saw it. We pre-gamed and I didn't. So our published author, spoiler alert, sorry about that. Right now, I want to jump in and start on how you became a parent. Yes. So I became a parent when I was 26. Um, I grew up in the evangelical Christian church. And so it was very much emphasized to marry young, have kids, stay at home, be a supportive helper. Uh, And so that's really what I did. I got married at 22, had my first kiddo at 26 and really embraced what it meant to be super mom. (laughs) You know, I think that's interesting though. You, you took four years after you got married in order Mm -hmm. to have it or to have a child, right? Because Mm -hmm. I was in the Mormon church for 17 oh, years. Okay. I, or I, yeah, we didn't know we had this in common. Yeah. And the same, the same, I want to say pressure or expectation that you mm-hmm. marry young. Um, a lot of that is because you can't have sex before you get yep, married. 100 percent so. Yep. Um, and then procreation. I still fully believe at how incredible women are at being able to have a baby. I mean, I'm a doula. Mm-hmm. So like, I love yeah. that, but I don't, I feel like that pressure and stress, but you didn't actually have a baby for four years. So you held out in in my <laughs> book, opinion, you held out. <laughs> yeah, but we had fair, re- so we got married in undergrad and then my husband, um, I got into graduate school and then my husband was waitlisted for medical school. And so he, we wanted to wait until towards the end of medical school before having the first kiddo so I there mean was a, there was a method to the madness that's amazing <laughs> so but you yeah. had a baby um yeah at 26 mm-hmm. okay yep. and then how was that I mean mo- take us forward on that what was the pregnancy oh, like gosh. you get pregnant easily <laughs> yep I got pregnant easily um it took me the second try uh there's the second month and pregnancy was awful. I was sick a lot. I was on antidepressants or anti-anxiety meds before I got pregnant. And they were like, oh, you should go off of them because you know that might be harmful to the baby. So I was like, well, of course I'm going to go off of them. And right. yet I was <laughs> struggling with lots of anxiety still. And so then that was a real challenge being sick and trying to work and navigating your first pregnancy. And then also like feeling like I'm going to miscarry at any second. And there's something wrong with me, like just such this overwhelm of anxiety. So then they were like, yeah, maybe you should go back on your anxiety meds, uh, which mm. I did. And that helped significantly. And then the morning sickness after the first trimester subsided and had a normal pregnancy, uh, ended up having a C-section after being in labor for 23 hours. And uh, that was awful. And I just felt like I was behind when I started motherhood. Like I was so tired, so exhausted. Oh, okay. My my baby didn't sleep, you know, like all my other friends were like, oh, it's so great being a mom. And I was like, I don't love being a mom. Like it's freaking hard work and I'm tired and we don't have any family nearby. And my husband's in medical school. And like, it was a very lonely journey. Oh, I mean, I love, I hate that that happened to you. (laughs) I love you expressing that because- yes. I think that there's, especially if you're coming, and I don't know if you're still part of that church. No. Um, okay, I'm not either. But so when you get out of that situation, you realize how unrealistic those expectations are. So, wow, I have a, I have like so many questions for you because sure. of that. Um, <laughs> you were on anti-anxiety. How much did the church and the expectations contribute to that? Because I find... I I have found that women that I knew in the Mormon church Mm -hmm. were struggling as much, if not more, uh, as women outside of the church because their the expectations are so strict. Yeah, yeah. Jump in on that. 
Yeah. So my friends, my only mom friends in med school were, uh, were Mormons. And so even though I wasn't Mormon, oh, okay. like that was my community because they were the only other ones who had kids. And so I saw a lot of that pressure that they had. And, um, for me, honestly, I like, I turned to food, like I gained like 60 pounds during yep. my pregnancy. And I mean, I was I, lonely is really the best word I can describe mm. for my pregnancy. Um, and even the first, you know, year of being a mom, because it's you're being 26 and being married is not common in the medical school world. Yes. You know, like most people, most people just aren't doing that. And so like, you're kind of this weirdo that's like, wait, you're married and you have a kid, um, unless you're Mormon. And then I was like, well, I'm not Mormon, but I'm part of, you know, and whatever. So, uh, it was, it was hard and lots of, I didn't feel a pressure actually from my church, but I also didn't feel supported by them either. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's interesting. I mean, yeah. it's just, you know, unless you have lived that lifestyle and what those expectations are, it's kind of hard for me to even explain yeah. how challenging it was to try to be this perfect member of the church and mom mm -hmm. and not lose your mind. I, I feel like yeah. you're, you're kind of set up for failure. And my ex-husband yeah. is, was a dentist. So oh, I was yeah. also in the medical field like you were and yeah, anomaly the, the, all the way across the board. It is very lonely. That's, that makes me sad. And because of the anti-anxiety meds and then going back on them, and I'm sure like fear is something going to happen to the baby. Oh, is this really the best yeah. thing? Am I being selfish? Absolutely. Yep. Because I'm taking yes. my health. Over. Right. And then 24 hour labor and C-section. So kind of jump into some of that, the the mm -hmm. decision to go back on anti-anxiety and my opinion on that, I'm going to throw it in, even though nobody asked. Um, I always, somebody asked me the other day about breastfeeding and medication and I, it was an antibiotic. And I'm like, if women are drug users and they're on methadone during their pregnancy and they need to stay on it or the baby will die like instantly. Um, so if they have to stay on methadone and it's better for them to breastfeed on methadone, we're really stressed about an antibiotic. So like, I think some things in lives are, are your perspective, right? Yeah. You're talking yeah. about an opioid compared to an antibiotic. Not yeah. that we don't have to be cautious because you want to be sure. on the right antibiotic for breastfeeding or pregnancy or whatever. Um, so it's still important to look into it, but I think we get so caught up with, you know, worrying about affecting the baby, which we should be when I know that in every category, anxiety being this category, there's one that's fine. Mm -hmm. You're right. Absolutely. Anti yeah. there, it's fine. Yeah. And it's better to take care of yourself than the alternative. So hundred yes, percent. That's my opinion anyway. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> so yeah. I'm glad that I went back on it and I, and I had two um, kids after my first one and was on it the whole time. And the pregnancy was much less anxiety provoking. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. Well, tell me about the 24 hour labor and the C-section because that's a lot. Yeah. yeah so uh, my water broke early. Uh, I was like 38 and a half weeks and uh, it wasn't like a gush, you know, like you see in the movies. It was like, a. it never is. <laughs> I was like, is this, is, I think, I think my water broke. This is weird. Um, and so then I get to the hospital and the nurses like, didn't believe me because they're like the first baby you're never within you you always go over 40 weeks. We doubt that your water broke, but we'll admit you. Okay. Take, you know, do the strip to see. And they're like, Oh, your water oh. did break. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> um, I was like, I'm not lying you guys. Like, uh, but my contractions weren't hitting fast enough. So they put me on Pitocin, yeah. uh, and, uh, I got an epidural. I was very like, it's so funny. Conveyor belt. Me, if I, the yes. labor conveyor belt. Right. Yes. Right. I, if I would have a baby now, it would be a much different experience. But, you know, in my 20s, I was I, I just didn't have any idea, really. And just the information wasn't readily available as it is now and the, the different alternatives. And I didn't even know what a doula was like, uh -huh. you know, um, and so uh, so I'm barely like progressing. But, you know, like I'll hit it. OK, now I'm, you know, uh, dilating, dilating, dilating. I get fully dilated. I finally start. And at this time they wouldn't let me leave the bed. So, and I could only have ice chips. So I'm yep. going on the, and I'm, my water broke in the middle of the night. So I'm over like 24 hours of no food and no liquid. 
and my I'm just drained. I'm so exhausted. And they're like, okay, go ahead and start pushing. So I start pushing for like an hour and she's just not getting past my pelvic inlet. And my doctor wasn't on the call. It was another doctor who I'd never met. And he was like, you could keep pushing, but like, honestly, I would go with a C-section, you know? Uh -huh. And so I was like, oh, and, and at that point I was so exhausted. I didn't care. I was like, you can take right. her out my nose. You can take her out my nose. I don't care. But then I felt this overwhelming sense of defeat of like, there's something oh. wrong. And I remember apologizing to my, I'm so sorry that I couldn't do it vaginally. I'm so sorry. I couldn't do it. And he's like, I don't care. I don't care. And like the, the baby was in no distress, but because I was approaching the 24 hours of having yeah. my water broke, yeah. they were like watching that clock. And so they're like, you gotta, you gotta do something. So, um, so I said, fine, take her. I don't care. And then she came out and everything was fine, but it just, the breastfeeding, I, I'll never forget when they were like, okay, we're going to massage your uterus afterwards. And like how they push down oh, on, on your bundle massage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. That is the most painful thing I have ever been through in my entire life. I was like, oh. so that was traumatic, but I mean, otherwise it was, I mean, it really wasn't a traumatic birth. I don't want to you know say that lightly. Cause I know there are people who have very you know, traumatic births and mine was not, it was, I would say disappointing um, and exhausting yeah. for the two words. I that, mean, that categorize it. Yeah. Normal, right. Nor yeah. normal that it's disappointing. I mean, yeah. And that's, I think you don't know what you don't know. And we go into labor that first time. I mean, I think I went in totally blind and I, um, only didn't get the epidural because the anesthesiologist noticed I was pushing, but nobody else did. Or I would have done, mm -hmm. I, I was on the same sort of conveyor yeah. belt because you go in and you're young and you've never done it before and you don't even know the questions to ask. Oh, and then you yeah. come out the other side and you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. That doesn't <laughs> seem like it was right. But in the moment, there's not a lot that you can do to to advocate for yourself when you don't even know what the options are. And it's very, at the very least, defeating. And then you have yeah. the recovery and you said you have no family around, right? So no. you're exhausted. My mom was gonna, yeah, my mom was going to fly out, but she, but my daughter came early. So then she, it actually ended up being nice because she, I was in the hospital for three days because that's how long they keep you yep. when you have a C-section. And so then by the time she got there, I was, had just gotten released from the hospital. So that was nice. My mom was there for like two weeks and was super helpful, but yeah, I, she, I, I honestly was like, okay, well now, I, I mean, I'm an intelligent person. I knew exactly. I read all the pregnancy books, but then I was like, well, now what do I do with a baby? Like, can't be that hard, right? Like, mor <laughs> like morons have babies all the time and like they can wing it. And I just was like, why isn't she sleep? Like nobody tells you, at least back then, nobody was like, it's really freaking hard. It is, they don't, some of them don't sleep. And I had heard the word colic and I was like, I don't understand what any of that means. I'm following all of these steps and like nothing's working and I'm so tired and my body like the weight did not magically spill off like everyone kind of like said that it would or had modeled I felt like I looked like a deflated balloon and when I came out of the hospital and so then you know you're dealing with your own body image issues and oh gosh yeah yeah it's it's a lot I think here's the issue is like say there are 20 things that could happen postpartum right and, but you're going to get six and I don't know which six they are. Yeah. So I'm always like, why are people so sharing every negative story that they, the, the most negative story that they have, they see somebody pregnant and feel like it's okay to verbally vomit the most negative yeah. thing possible. And that makes me frustrated, but then women don't get information. And here's the thing. It's going to be hard. I don't know in what way for you yes. it's yeah. going to be hard, but it's going to be the hardest thing you ever did. I remember telling my daughter that, and she's like, well, I've been a nanny, and I've done this. <laughs> Over all things, <laughs> right? Yes. Yes. All things, and I was like, 100%, and that gave you a lot of experience. All I can say is it's not going to be the same, and it's going to mm -hmm. be hard, and I don't know how. Yeah. And later, she was like, I don't know if being a nanny prepared me at all, and it did. Yeah. It absolutely did. But we don't know. And I hate sharing negative stories. Like yeah. one woman was like, nobody tells you your hips will spread three inches and never go back. 
well, I mean, I was happy about that. That was no big deal for me. And maybe it's yeah. not the same for everyone. So it's so hard. Yeah. And then you do it again. So yeah. how did you move forward through that and having more kids? Um, I think we just knew that we wanted three kids. Like we just okay. were, I, w- I was a big planner. So I was just, yes. Okay. And I researched and at the time, the research was showing that, you know, the best sibling spacing was two years, uh, in terms of like long-term relationship, uh, closeness for when they're adults. And I was like, okay, yeah, like I could do that. I'll lock up. I can, and, you know, and like, there's this fear that if I waited until they, I was older to have kids that like, there would be much more likely to have genetic issues or I'd have a hard time getting pregnant. So there, again, there's this push, uh, to have babies when you're young, like use, you know, those most, uh, young eggs, use them, use them up. Yes. And so, uh, yeah. So I was like, okay, so right around, uh, what's nine months minus 24, whatever the 14, 13, 14 month, uh, mark is, I was like, okay, so she's walking now. She's, you know, like talking and like, she's still really needy. She's still super clingy, like, okay, but maybe it'll be better with two. And so I got pregnant right away and had a schedule that I was trying for a VBAC okay. and, and the doc that happened to be on call when I was like around 39 and a half weeks. Cause the, they did like a, I can't remember, like a heart rate of the baby. And yeah. they noticed that it was decelerating and they're like, ah, I feel really comfortable admitting you. We're going to keep a monitor on you. And they just didn't notice it improving. And so they're yeah. like, you know, we would like to admit you and, you know, start the whole process. Uh, and I said, well, I'd really like to do a VBAC. And the doc on call was like, I don't feel comfortable doing a VBAC. Um, oh. I think that there's too much, there's, you know, too much of a risk, blah, blah, blah. And so he said, so if you want, we can do a C-section tomorrow morning, blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, fine. So it's hard to fight the system. You know, there are things that make me so angry about pregnancy. And one of the things is the doctor will say, you have double the chance of uterine hemorrhage. Mm. True, true story, right? Of someone who hasn't had a VBAC. It mm-hmm. goes, it's like 0.05 to 0.1. Like they're not lying, but they're not telling you the truth either. Or they're yeah. not giving you all the information. Like you have yeah. you have almost no greater chance of uterine hemorrhage than someone without a VBAC. But that's, it's it's how to word things without lying but also teenagers are great at this. We can talk about that too. <laughs> like <laughs> massaging the truth or like telling part of the information or completely not lie. It's not a lie. It does double, yeah. but they don't tell you the rate. And, and that makes me furious. So you had a second C-section, then you have two, which obviously two makes it better. You know what makes it even better? Three. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, three sure does. Yes. Three's the um, hardest. Mm-hmm. So my, again, uh, eight what 14 months later was like okay like it's time not got another spacing. kid so the yep. first the first month I didn't get pregnant but the second month I did uh and so I I do recognize that that's not the case for a lot of women is getting pregnant that easily uh and similar pregnancies first trimester really sick and then afterwards you know it got better for the most part but when we did the uh, anatomy scan at around 20 weeks, they found that my son had a club left foot. And so that was something that, you know, they were like, well, there's a couple of indicators. We don't think he has downs, but these are some of the things we're concerned about. Um, You know, like the, the, the foot could correct itself on its own, but we're not really sure. And so then I was like, okay. And then about four three months before my son was born, we got, my husband's in the military. And so we got orders to move. And so we knew that a month after my son was going to be born, we'd be moving from Washington state to Texas. And that makes care for a baby with a club left foot, a little bit challenging because you need to do the serial casting, like pretty much immediately within the first few months of life. Yeah. So that was, you know, something to deal with. So I had three kids who were four and under, um, about to move to Texas and dealing with a club foot diagnosis. Did you, so I had a diagnosis. I, we were also military. Oh, okay. It's crazy. 
Uh, I love the common denominators. Mm -hmm. And I ended up fly. It was my first child, though. And I ended up flying to where my mom lived mm. for the end of my pregnancy because of the potential issue with my daughter. Mm. Um, that's a really hard situation to be in. People don't also don't understand that unless you're in that situation. So yeah. did you end up, what happened with the end of the pregnancy and the casting and everything? Did, did, did he, was he born with a club foot? He was. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So, so it was, was a correct, cause you know, there's a 15 mm -hmm. to 20% chance they're wrong. Right. Right. Yep. So he was definitely born with it. Um, so within the first, I think when he was six days old, he got his first cast. And that was fun because people looked at me like I abused my kid because you have this little newborn baby with a cast, like all, you know, all the way up from his hip to his, to his foot and changing diapers was, oh gosh, a nightmare um, because that cast is like right up there on their, you know, towards their yeah. hip. And uh, so that was stressful. And then we had to go back every week for the first four weeks to get a new cast because to whatever they were doing. And then they put him in what's called a, I think it's a Ponsetti bar. I mean, my son's almost 11, so it's been a long time, but it mm -hmm. looks like a snowboard. Like, so he's got okay. his little feet like that are out, they're turned out and it looks like a snowboard. And again, people just were like, what, you know, just a yeah. lot of stares and confusion and, um, so then we moved to Texas and thankfully the doctor up in Washington had a good relationship with the doc down in Texas and was able to get us in right away. But, you know, I, and I think it helped that my husband was also a physician and we knew how to navigate, you know, the military medical system, yes. but I, I could see how easily people could fall through that if they're, if they're not on top of it, because it's a huge thing you have to get, it's not like you can just show up to the hospital. You have to wait to get registered within the hospital system you know, like switch everything over. It's, it's not as simple as it may seem. No, and it's not. It's very, it's very complicated and time consuming. And you don't have time with a five week old who has a club foot. Like you need to be getting serial casted and having that check right. checkup in, in a certain time period. So you have three kids, you move to a new place. Mm -hmm. Um, I mentioned your book at some point, are you still married to I'm the still married? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Same person, but you yep. guys left the church. Yes, we left the evangelical church. We switched to um, more of a progressive, non-denominational uh, Christian church. But in the last few years, we've stopped attending church. Mm. We still identify as Christian, but I would, you know, some people would say, well, if you're not going to church, then you're not a Christian. So, I mean, there's, we could have an entire yeah. podcast just on that. <laughs> Same thing for me. I mean, when I left the Mormon church, I felt... I uh, like it wasn't my faith or beliefs mm -hmm. that stopped me. I felt so overwhelmed and how to move forward too, mm -hmm. um, that I didn't go for a long time. And <clears throat> then you find a place and then you're not, it's not quite the right fit. There's a lot that goes into that. Yeah. So, but I divorced and left the Mormon church and switched. And so good for you for getting that's there's some tough stuff you have to get through and being married so you've been married yeah. for like 20 years now yeah we celebrated actually yesterday was our 19th anniversary look at me doing math in my head i know good congratulations job. <laughs> Thank okay you. so i want to fast forward you have three kids which i think is the hardest i thought three like i did fine with one fine with two i thought i was a genius i had three and i was like holy cow but <laughs> then after that it was fine um but for some reason three and you have a son that was born with a a developmental mm -hmm. need and yeah. a medical mm -hmm. need and you've moved and you're military and eventually you leave the church and then somehow bridge the gap between your book and your business and that mm -hmm. life. Cause that might be a big yeah. jump. I don't know. So when I was, um, when my daughter was in, when I had one kid, I went to graduate school and got a master's in human sexuality. Okay. And then I, we, when we moved to Washington States and my husband did his residency, I got a second master's in mental health counseling. And so during that time, oh. I opened up a mental health and sex therapy practice and was uh, an adjunct professor at a university and taught uh, human development, sexuality classes. And then he, we got orders to move to Texas and 
I closed, I had to close it all down and now I'm in Texas and not working because the life, the licensure laws in Texas were different than Washington and they didn't have reciprocity, blah, blah, blah. And okay. then we're there for three years. I do some speaking. I talk to parents about like how to talk to their kids about sex. I do some mm. consulting work. And then we moved to North Carolina. And that's when I started really getting into the coaching world because I was like, oh, I don't have to have a license to be a coach and I can still help people. Right. And so that's really what allowed me to set up a practice there. And then we moved again. This time we moved to Germany, uh, which we are at now. And that's when I started to write my book and really wanted to help more women because I felt like I was dealing with so like facing so many of the same clients who were dealing with the same issues, feeling sexually broken and feeling like there was something wrong with them. I think, well, I have opinions on everything as we've already established. <laughs> I think coming from a really strict religious background, and there are lots of them. I mean, Catholicism, if you're strict, is one of them. Um, Jehovah's Witness, there are a lot. And yeah. I feel like in these religions, you're told, no, 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 it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. Yep. And then uh, you got to get married, you got to get married, you got to get married. And then at your wedding, they're like, here's your chandelier and your Superman cape, mm -hmm. go. And you can't feel like something is bad and yep. wrong and dirty and secret your whole life and then flip yeah. a switch. I also think that mm -hmm. there's a gross lack of education about especially oh. for women but oh gosh like do <laughs> yes. like men don't get the map you know there's a whole situation happening they don't yeah. have the map yeah. and women don't know how to tell them that oh, absolutely like right. i don't have the map either i have like no experience nope. and nope. you put that them together and tell them go have babies get married mm -hmm. and your job is to have babies and that means you have to have sex but you have no and I don't mean sex education, like the physical, this is what does this right. and how it yeah. works. I mean, like the real map, this is an emotional thing, a physical yeah. thing. Uh, yeah. And you have this massive drive to yes. want it. Yep. And I just saw in the Mormon church with friends, a lot of sexual dysfunction in relationships because they never bridge that gap. No, um, mm -hmm. but I know it's not just with, strict religions i just know it's very apparent in my opinion in a strict religion it's super apparent um because we're not messing around as much absolutely well and i wanted to make a point when you were talking about how like this thing is bad i yeah. wish that people only thought that the problem is that they think i'm bad because yeah. i have sexual thoughts and so then now we have to deal with this whole suitcase of sexual shame, because not only is this thing that I've been denying horrible, gross, weird, wrong, I don't even understand it because I it's bad, but I desired it because that's how I'm wired there because that's how our bodies are designed. Right. So there's something wrong with me on top of that. I mean, then let's just say that didn't happen. You had... Mm -hmm positive sexual experiences in the beginning yeah. um you were with a man that was patient and you were patient mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you explored and it was positive I think then you know women then you get pregnant then you even you mentioned body image after you have a baby and oh, feeling absolutely. like a deflated balloon yeah. um and recovering from that and the fact that I think if that if that wound from having a baby well yours was on the outside your c-section scar but mm -hmm. if we put the scar from where the placenta detached if our uterus was flipped inside out and you could see it on your body people would be like <gasps> don't get up let me get that for you but it's not and mm -hmm. we are dismissive of ourselves and our feelings i think women are very dismissive of what Absolutely. we need Mm -hmm. Um, and then we talk about self-care, which can be a whole tangent that ends up not being positive. So yeah. I can see why, first of all, congratulations on all your masters and everything. I'm very oh. proud of you. That's Thank really you. awesome. <laughs> That's a lot. That's really Thank great. You. And then you published a book and I'm very proud of you about that. Cause those are all hard things to do, but yeah. I can see where you, in your experience, you looked out around you and went, oh my gosh, there's such a need. Yeah. Yeah. It is. I mean, I, 
anytime I would go and speak to women's groups, I did a lot of mops, like mothers and yeah. preschoolers. Yeah. So I'd go into a lot of those. Um, and I would invariably have somebody say, raise their hand and say, my husband thinks there's something wrong with me. How can you help me? Or I would have women come to, into my office and say, I'm only here because my husband is basically making me come here because our we have like no sex ever. And he's basically threatening to get a divorce. And like, I could be fine with never having sex again, but I'm tired of arguing about it. So, you know, it's, I was like, okay, ladies, we got to do something with this. <laughs> I mean, I'm on, I'm on this women's running team. And I remember women talking about how, there was this one run in particular, like, well, we just did it. So that bought me two more weeks and yep. it's winter. So I'm not going to shave my legs until spring. And I just said, let me tell you, if this relationship is so bad and you get a divorce, the first thing you're going to be doing is shaving your legs. And you know why? Because you're going to be getting your body and yourself ready to date again, to yeah. do the very things you're saying in your marriage, you don't do or don't want to do or don't like to do like I shave my legs every other day, not because it's fun and I love it, but because taking care of my, it feels good to take care of yourself. Sure. Yeah. And a side note of that is that my husband likes that I shave my legs every other day, even in the winter. And I just think we get into this mentality where you, you well, he's married to you. So you don't have to, you don't have to do anything to keep him around, which is such mm -hmm. a bad mentality. And if you want to have sex to buy yourself two weeks, something's not right. Like, yeah, you should yeah. want it every day. <laughs> you should be chasing him. Yes. Like yes. that is not right. It's not healthy. And the fact that women can't don't feel don't feel that way or don't feel comfortable feeling that way or the experience is not great. So they don't feel like whatever reason you have mm -hmm. for feeling that way. None of it is OK. You should you should be chasing him, you know, so yeah. tell me. I think it's super common and it's super sad because I know every one of my friends and myself included, the second you get divorced, you're shaving your legs, meeting people and having sex again. All the mm -hmm. things you didn't do in your marriage. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that the, I it, mean, it, gosh, it's so, it's so complicated, but it, it also is, I know so I just, you know, I mean, it, yes. it, it, it's so simple. Like if women gave themselves and really for me, what I see is that it comes down to women, not believing that they are worthy and deserving of pleasure and not just pleasure inside the bedroom, but in all areas of life. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if, if a woman doesn't see herself as being confident enough to advocate one, she doesn't know what she wants because she never got the map. She's never been given permission to explore what she wants. Um, then how is she going to tell her, her spouse, hey, I want you to do this to me or that to me. Like when she lacks the skills and tools to have that conversation, let alone the confidence to even say the word vulva, vagina, clitoris, you know, orgasm, all yes. those things. Um, and I get that question a lot. Like, how do I talk to my partner about sex? Like we've been married for 10 years. We don't ever talk about it. It's just kind of something that happens. And like, I don't know how to, and I'm like, sorry, but it's going to be awkward. Like, I would love to tell you that you can make it smooth and fun. And, but the, the more confident you are in any topic, the more e easily able you are to have a conversation with someone and not feel embarrassed about it. And yeah. I think that there's, there's a lot more resources now than when I was first married in terms of, you know, equipping yourself and like, okay, how can I, like, is this normal? Do I, do I, how do I say this or like want this? But yeah, I, I think for me, like what I see for so many women is that they just don't believe they deserve pleasure. Wow. That hurts my heart so much. <laughs> it does, which is why I do the work that I do is because I'm so freaking passionate about women knowing like educating equipping and empowering those women to know that like because I believe that a pleasured woman is a powerful woman and powerful women can change the world I mean mic drop on that one <laughs> I, like I would end there except tell me how people can get in touch with you I know that sure. they can do things virtually because you're in Germany Yes. Mm -hmm. um, who we, I already kind of know who your ideal client is, but what you would tell them about, I'm imagining this person 
feeling resistance or embarrassment to reach out to you. So can you kind of, in whatever way you want, address that? And I know everything's in our show notes, but the easiest way to get in touch with you. Yeah. So the uh, social media, Instagram, uh, I'm the most active on. So yep. Courtney Boyer coaching. Um, but I've been in this field first. I worked as a sexuality educator in like a lot of high risk populations. So like think juvenile detention center with 17 year old boys um, and giving them sex ed. So I've, li I've literally heard it all. I've heard everything you could possibly think. Nothing embarrasses me. And that's something that my clients really appreciate is that even strangers appreciate. They'll be like, they find out what I do. And then they just like dump on me and they're like, you're so, I'm so glad I got to talk to you. And I was like, okay, you know, whatever. But um, so it's okay to feel embarrassed, but if nothing changes, nothing changes. And so really take that first step to be brave and know that you're not alone. What you're facing, I've worked with hundreds of women who have already faced it and you, you can feel better. Like it doesn't have to be this way. Thank you so much, Courtney, for being on You're and welcome. sharing your story so boldly. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you.